This is Duke University. Well, first, let me thank Paula and everybody who's been involved with the RBSI for a long, long time. Uh, you know, I've, I've talked to various people, including John Aldrich, who I know all of you know. Uh, and I was telling him just today what a gift, uh, I mean, literally and figuratively, Duke has been uh, for the RBSI. And Paula has spearheaded that uh, prior to being here at Duke. She was the leader of it when, uh, back at uh, uh, UVA, and she's been so, talk about foundational. Uh, uh, that, that's an understatement in terms of what she has contributed to APSA in a whole variety of ways. And uh, RBSI is monumental in itself, but it's a small sliver of what she's done. So I hope all of you, uh, you know, many of you are too young to realize that or recognize it, but uh, I hope you will come to appreciate that uh, and, and its importance for, our, for political science and for uh, higher education in the United States more broadly. Um, and, and I'm also very pleased to, to be, uh, to speak with you today. And I'm going to talk a little bit about a couple things regarding political science and my own research. But I, I do want to say, uh, in addition to, uh, you know, my work and what I've been working on for the last number of years, I mentioned it to the folks around the table here a few minutes ago, that some of what I'm going to talk about today in terms of some of my current research has been pretty deeply influenced by people like Frank Baumgartner, Paula, and Carrie's work as well. Uh, so, so in a sense, I think you'll hopefully develop an appreciation for how knowledge and research accumulates or builds upon the insights and the, and the, and the excellent scholarship of previous work. Uh, so, so that's something you know, I, I, I will want to emphasize with you. But let me begin by, by uh, kind of giving you a little bit background about what I want to talk about today. Uh, I've made a couple of presentations, a number of presentations this year actually as president of APSA. And um, one of the ones that I've made has been to various uh, Hispanic serving institutions and to also to some historically black colleges where what I've talked about there is called, the, I call the promise of political science. And what I've talked about there, and let me just go ahead and formally start this, and I apologize for the formality implied by this, but uh, I talk about the promise of political science. And personally, when I think of the promise of political science, why it's a, such an intriguing and I think you know, appealing and uh, exciting area of research, is that there are at least two major components of what I think of as the promise of political science. One is the passion of, for politics that political scientists bring to the discipline. I, all of us have various kinds of substantive issues, uh, uh, events in the world, our life experiences, or things we see out there that really you know, motivate us to think carefully and, 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 and uh, thoughtfully about you know, what is this stuff that we call politics? And how is it that this or that happens in the world? And why did it happen? Or why did this not happen? And why did it happen in this way? Or, or whatever the case might be. But I think most of us have within us a real passion for wanting to understand politics. And I think that's something that, that you should embrace and hold on to uh, forever, uh, whether you go into political science or not, uh, which I certainly hope all of you will, of course. But in addition to that, the second part of that, when I think of the promise of political science, and this is what uh, a lot of what you've been doing in the last five weeks here at RBSI, of course, is to develop ways of systematically analyzing, systematically understanding, making sense of the political world. It's one thing to have you know, your views, your, your concerns, your emotions, and so on. That's all very important, but it's also uh, important to, to uh, try and determine how you can systematically address and examine and understand those. And to me, that's what's always been so exciting about politics uh, and political science as a discipline, is I know that there are things out, out there <clears throat> that I care about and other people care about. And that's important to define those, to frame those, to, to you know, take those to heart in a certain way. But it's also important that you have a way of trying to say, how do I make sense of that? How do I help myself? How do I help others? How do I help society understand these issues more deeply, more thoughtfully, and, and hopefully develop some ways of, of you know, coming up with ideas and, and, uh, and, and suggestions about how, in some ways, the world will be made better. I know that sounds very you know, broad and, and uh, whatever, but, but 
you know, I, I think it's an important thing about political science that, that, that really, uh, I, I think, motivates just about all of us who are political scientists and have, particularly after you've been doing it for many years, you, you want to believe and you have to believe, but you actually believe that political science has those, those, those uh, at least those two major components to it. Again, the passion for understanding politics and secondly, a way of trying to understand it in a systematic kind of way. And I suspect that most of you in the papers that you that uh, that you uh, your projects for this class uh, were, were you know pro has both those elements to it, and uh, I, I, I I'm sure you realize that. But you know reflect on that some as you uh, as you uh, go forward and, and leave the program and and uh, reflect back on what you have learned in it. Okay, so I I would just uh, 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 indicate that to you. What I want to talk about to you uh, fairly briefly, uh, uh, part, and I hope this is not too researchish because I know this is as a social event and so on, but I, I do want to share with you a few things that, that I've been thinking about or working on recently uh, just to give you an idea of some thoughts that I have. And again, you know, I, I'll probably note it again, uh, uh, but it is influenced by some of the work of, of the people around the, uh, at, at this event here tonight. So let me just talk about a couple of uh, uh, recent research projects that I'm working on. Uh, they haven't entirely come to fruition yet, uh, uh, but, and that's also kind of the exhilaration and the frustration at times of political science is that you have these ideas that you want to study and they don't just happen overnight. They take a lot of time and effort and investment and at times frustration, but hopefully it leads to something valuable in, in some uh, significant kind of way. So let me talk about, uh, I'll be turning to that momentarily, but let me just actually t touch upon two things quickly here. You see the sign, and I hope it's very clear. Can you read it, what its sign says? Ralph Bunch Road, okay? And uh, where I took that, and this picture as well, and that's me, uh, <laughs> that, uh, I was in Kenya last year, and I was, uh, we were staying at a, 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 this hotel in Nairobi, and we were, so, at the end of the block somehow, there was this street sign, the Ra Ralph Bunch Road in Kenya. So it, it indicates to you that someone like Ralph Bunch was not only a very important figure in American politics, American society, American political science, but also had a very deep and broad impact in the world. And so I just thought, given that I, 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 really, I really like this picture anyway, but I thought it was an appropriate thing to suggest to you about how political science and political scientists are, you know, have significance uh, beyond. N that one, not so much, but anyway, <laughs> we'll move on. Okay, all right, what I want to talk to you about is very quickly, and I'm gonna do this in a pretty superficial kind of way, so, I, uh, so bear with me in that regard. But there's two projects I want to talk about. One is, uh, I'm working on a project now that basically the broad ideas, uh, thinking about the racial structure of inequality and redistribution in the United States. What prompts this study, and I'll do this for now, what prompted this study is that, you know, and, and I'm not the only person working in this area. Uh, me and my collaborators are not the only ones working in this area by any means. But, but part of what had gotten us to thinking about this is the following. As you know, there's been a lot of discussion over the last number of years, decade or so, about the Great Recession in the United States. And going back some years prior to that, the Great divergence. I don't know if you've heard those phrases. The great divergence that I believe it may have been Paul Krugman, I'm not sure who it was, but some, some economist said the great divergence means there's been this increasing dramatic economic inequality in the United States that they've traced back to about starting in the 70s or 80s. And, so, and, and you know, there's evidence that that is occurring. Again, punctuated, I think, by the great recession of, of 2007, 2008 into the present. In that, in that great recession, one of the things that happened that we know is that the existing inequality that already uh, was in place was exacerbated significantly. So if you see data on things like you know, uh, blacks and Latinos, for example, in terms of their wealth, not just their income, but their wealth, was diminished dramatically because for many uh, 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 black and Latinos, their major assets, their major forms of wealth was owning a house. And if you lose your house, you've lost a major part of your, part of your assets. All right. So, so there's been a lot of attention to that. So 
our, our view, when my, my collaborators and I, as, as we thought about this, is that there has been a lot of attention, and understandably so, though, to greater economic inequality. But we also have occurring at the same time in the United States the talk, and I think it's mostly this kind of rhetoric in some, in some important respects, about, about notions of a post-racial society. So we have these different kinds of narratives out there, economic inequality, post-racial society, greater diversity. And so there's these, these different kinds of narratives going on there. And so we're, part of what, what uh, 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 I and my collab major collaborator on this, a former graduate student at Berkeley, uh, talked about is that, you know, uh, let's try and see if we might delve into this some. So what we've done, is, wh what we did is, uh, uh, a, a study, and I'm just going to show you like one or two graphs that kind of try and summarize this. But what, what we did was this, is that uh, using a certain kind of method or, or measure that uh, economists use, uh, something called a Thiel index, uh, we were able to, we think, effectively be able to look at the degree of growing economic inequality, but also somehow separate that out from uh, racial inequality in the United States. All right, this measure, so, uh, presumably helps us do this. So we collected this data going back to like 1980, trying to look at the patterns over time. And the unit of analysis for our study, the unit of analysis for our study is the states of the United States, but we also aggregate the data in other kinds of ways. And I'm, I'm using kind of jargon here, but I think some of you are now familiar with this, so I hope it's not too jargonish for, for you uh, uh, now RBSI graduates or graduates to be. Uh, so what we did was then we tried to say, OK, let's try and, and see what the patterns are over time. So we collected some data. And, and, and this is basically the, a concluding table that we have uh, in, this, in this. And I hope this is visible here. I don't think it's as visible as I had hoped, actually, or expected. But in any case, what we have here, if you can see it at all, we have several measures. Here's an overall index. That dark line is uh, this one right here. Is, is meant to represent the overall, and, I, and Frank has seen this one before, I believe, uh, this overall degree of, of uh, uh, increased inequality. This here has, this dotted line suggests a, growing, a racial inequality over time from 1982 here. And then we have this measure here of, of growing economic inequality. Now, there's, there are a couple things that, that we, as the people doing this research, think are important. One is that, you know, this line here does indicate that there is this great growth in economic inequality. That line right there, that kind of, not, not the thick black line, but that, that uh, other black line, the not so thick one. And then here is, again, the racial inequality. Well, you see that this has increased dramatically. This looks fairly flat, but increasing some toward the end, all right? Uh, and there's a lot of technical stuff behind this, but, you know, for the sake of it. Uh, but, you know, there are a couple things that I think that when we look at this that we, that, that we take away. One is, yes, there is indeed the growing economic inequality that, that has been talked about. So when people talk about the great div divergence and so on, yes, our evidence tends to affirm that or support that. But at the same time, what we find is interesting is that the racial inequality as we measure it is also, it was fairly steady, but there is actually a slight uptick toward the, those latter number of years. And people might say, well, look, it, you know, it's not as much as the economic inequality. Okay, that may be correct. But what we think is interesting is that after things like the civil rights movement and the suppo supposed post-racial society, we thought that that line would have been flatter or maybe we might have expected a, a slight downturn in that. But we don't see that, all right, we don't see that. Now, so this is kind of a description of what those patterns seem to be. It's a description. But then the next question that we have is that, well, you know, this, we think this is important, and it might be important for a variety of reasons. But one of the things we're interested in, in ascertaining is how does it matter? Does it matter? And so what we look at, and this is our dependent variable, for the, you know, use words that you all know now, uh, the dependent variable is we look at welfare policy in the 50 states of the U.S. We look at welfare policy, and we have four or five different ways of measuring welfare policy. Per capita spending on welfare, uh, welfare spending as a portion of state uh, ex uh, expenditures, like four or five different ways because we want to assure that, you know, that whatever we find isn't a, a function of just looking at one particular indicator of the, uh, 
of the uh, welfare policy. So what we find, and I'm not going to show this to you here necessarily, uh, we have some other little graphs that show this, but what we find in all cases is this, and, and, and I think this is intriguing. One is that we do find, uh, what we don't find is as intriguing as what we do find. What we don't find is that that great increase in economic inequality, as severe and, and, and significant as it clearly is, seems to have no impact on welfare spending in the states of the U.S. over that 30-year period. So you have growing economic inequality, but virtually no impact on welfare policy, which is kind of contradictory to some of the research that's been done on the, quote, welfare state research in the European countries in the U.S. So that kind of finding that people say, well, when there's more inequality, the masses through the vote, through the electoral process can mobilize and try and at, uh, get government to adopt policies that, that will address the inequality. And therefore, we, w we might l uh, reasonably expect to see greater spending on welfare. What that seems not to be the case. Our evidence suggests that that is not the case. However, this degree of, of racial inequality, we look at what impact that has on welfare spending, and it has an impact, a significant impact, and a negative impact. So we have two kinds of strange things. We have this, again, economic inequality increasing, but no impact on public policy. The, the racial inequality continuing, fairly stable, but even slightly increasing, with a strong negative impact. That's a fairly distinct kind, if our findings are correct, and I think they basically are, I'm pretty confident that they basically are, is that you know, in the United States, and I don't think it's this way in all Western democratic countries, in fact, I'm quite certain that it's not, is, is uh, we have kind of a unique uh, situation in the United States where race, which is a topic that you've addressed a lot in your, in your uh, uh, classes, plays a very significant role. So, but again, part of the reason we began looking at it this way is again, because I feel like, and I would criticize my own research in this regard, is that perhaps we haven't, we, the scholars who study race politics a lot in the United States, maybe have not given as much attention to economic inequality in a systematic way as perhaps we should. So this is saying, okay, there is this perception, this narrative that economic inequality is really where everything is happening in the last you know, decade or more. Uh, so let's try and examine that, and we think it's not. So how do we make sense of this? Well, one way I sometimes, and maybe this is something I would not recommend for, for you, uh, but some of the way I try and think about things is sometimes is through analogies, and sometimes I come up with what I think are pretty some strange analogies. Nonetheless, I'm going to try, try one on you. Okay, the, so the way I guess I've, I've uh, come to think about this a little bit, about the interaction of race and economic inequality, is that. What is that? That's a DNA double helix. Mm -hmm. Have you seen the double helix of basically? So I, you know, it seems to me that these two, you know, if you let's say the blue is the economic inequality and the red is the racial. I think these things are actually intertwined in ways that I, I think most people recognize that that a at least they're correlated, uh, and we know that quite well. But they are interconnected in some kind of causal fashion as well. Uh, I think we know that. But I'm not sure that we, as political scientists at least, have been sufficiently attentive to or able to kind of look at the relationship between them in as careful and system systematic way as we might. So this is just one little thing that I've come up with in my own mind in terms of trying to think about that. So again, you can throw that one away. Uh, but, uh, but sometimes I, I try and think through analogy and, and, what I, and I just happened to see this double helix a while back. I said, uh, this, this might be informative in some way, but if you don't find it, I will not be offended. Uh, but thank you for indulging me for talking about it in the first place. All right, so let me then turn very to a, scientific. what's that? Very scientific. Very scientific and also very colorful. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right, all right. Then secondly, I, I just want to tell you a little bit about another project that I'm working on. That's, uh, and, this, and uh, this one very much is, has been influenced by the work of Paula and, uh, uh, and uh, Frank's work. So let me just uh, talk about it a little bit. Some of you may be, be familiar with a little bit of it. But I've been doing some work on inter-minority group relations, uh, uh, relations between racial groups, between black, Latinos, uh, primarily thus far, and then Asians is kind of the next step in the project that we're working on. 
So in a book that I did called Black Lat uh, co-authored uh, on black Latino relations in US national politics, the issue that was addressed in that book is trying to look at, again, that very question about the relationships between blacks and Latinos. There, there, there is or was a time in American politics where, where many uh, people argued, oh, there would presumably be almost a natural likelihood of black and Latinos uh, uh, coalescing, coming together, and being supportive of similar kinds of policies because of some broadly similar history in the United States, very broadly by some, you know, depending on how you think about it, but some similarity, the Rainbow Coalition that Jesse Jackson spoke about in the 1980s. Uh, uh, but then in the 1980s, 90s, and, so, and later, there emerged a fairly large literature in American politics that began saying that, oh, we think we're finding conflict, as much evidence of conflict as anything between blacks and Latinos. And a lot of that research was focused on urban politics, the study of urban politics in the United States. And, uh, but then others, like Paula in an article that, that she wrote, said, well, you know, we need to think of these things in a more sophisticated kind of way. We need to think beyond just cooperation or conflict, that there could be another alternative. And I think you all refer to it as independence. They use the term independence. We, in our work, ultimately call it non-conflict. Uh, we also call it, you know, a going your own way. There are various ways of characterizing that. But in any case, what we did in that book was to, was to try and look at that, and again, look at it at the national level, in national politics. Because our argument is, is that you know, there are various ways in which we think about American politics and how politics and relations, uh, all kinds of political uh, uh, relations, may vary according to different arenas or levels of the political system. You know, the, the argument that James Madison made in Federalist 10 is that, you know, you change the scope of conflict and then, then other political scientists elaborated those ideas uh, saying that, you know, where politics occurs can affect the nature of relationships between, uh, well, politics in general, but we try and uh, use that insight and we think it is a useful insight to then look at black Latino relations. But our argument was this, as we say, well, look, most people, a lot of people are arguing that there's conflict but they've looked at it only in one place, if you will, again, the, 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 uh, the local or urban politics. So let's look at the national level where we think there might be reason that it might differ in some, in some respects. All right, so, so what we did in that book, and I'll try and be very brief, what we did in that book was to look at black Latino relations in a variety of ways using a variety of indicators. We looked at things, for example, like, as you probably know, the NAACP and the Latino groups uh, create these, these scorecards uh, so they say, okay, how did these members of Congress vote on this or that? And we give them a score on that. Well, what, what we did in, the, in our analysis is we say, okay, the NAACP has a scorecard that they give to members of Congress over a period of time. And Latinos have, uh, Latino groups have those scorecards. So the first question we ask is that, well, when we look at the Latino interest groups and the black interest groups, one, are they identifying the same issues for their scorecards? in the first place. So what, are they seeing the same issues as being salient or not? All right. And what we found, a little bit to our surprise, I think, was that the extent to which the, the two groups identify the same issues was somewhat less than what we had anticipated. Maybe 25% of the time they identified the same, the same issues as, as being you know, relevant and putting them on their scorecard. Then the second part of that is, though, we, is we say, okay, when they do put the same issues on the scorecards, do they, do they uh, judge that this or that decision is, this or that vote on a, on a case is determined, on, on a, a, a bill, I should say, on a bill is, is determined to be the right vote. So there, you know, this, this uh, uh, bill raises this issue. Do blacks and Latinos both think that a yes vote on that is what you would want? Or do they both think a no vote on that? that is? So, so we looked at that. We also looked at how members of Congress vote on those specific court, uh, scorecards, the ones created by the blacks and Latino groups. So how do black members vote on the Latino scorecards? How do Latino members vote on the black scorecards? So we're trying, and basically what we find is that, you know, it's, it's more complicated than this, but there's no evidence of conflict. There's no evidence whatsoever of conflict in that regard, all right? And then we look at a couple of other things. Let me just uh, let me just mention one quickly because this is really picks up where this the next study, which is a WIP IP work in progress, uh, that that I will talk about momentarily. But we looked also at things like 
looking beyond just the, the legislative arena, we decided we wanted to look at the legal arena, the courts, and so on. So what we did there was to look at black and Latino legal advocacy groups, basically NAACP Legal Defense Fund and the uh, MALDEF, Mexican American Legal Defense and Education Fund. And what we do there is, is again, we ask two questions. Uh, of, of the briefs that they file over time, are they identifying the same briefs? Are, are, they, are, they, are they filing on, on the same briefs? And if they are filing on the same briefs, are they on the same side? Well, again, we found in that book that they, they don't file on the same briefs as much as people might, at least as not as much as we anticipated. It was more like on the order of 25, 30% of the time. But when they do file on the same uh, case, file a brief on the same case, again, they're always on the same side. So again, we're, we're not sure that's, we think in some cases we can say, yes, this is cooperation because they're co-signing a brief. That's a, we think, we would think that's a legitimate way of saying that that, that is cooperation. But there may be other ways in which one might sign, a, 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 submit a brief, but the other one might submit a, a, a different, a separate brief on the same case. So while they're on the same side, they're not necessarily making the same legal arguments. They're, they're trying to ground it in a somewhat different way, appealing to the court to, to you know, take this or that into consideration in, in distinguishing themselves from each other in terms of what they say. But again, overall, we found that there was really no evidence of, uh, of conflict uh, in, in the amicus process. Okay, so that's what we found in the book in a very capsule kind of, uh, short uh, summary. But that led us to think, well, we think this is interesting and important. We'd like to think it's interesting and important, of course. But then we think it might raise other questions for us as well. So we, we, we are doing a couple of things now. I just want to give you a real quick feel of what we're doing here. We're, we've decided, we tried to do two things. One is we said, OK, we're looking in the, in the book, we looked at blacks and Latinos. Now, in, in this further research, we're trying to look at blacks, Latinos, and Asian groups. And actually, the Asian group presents some complications in ways that the other two groups do not. Because there are several of the, uh, there's more than one prominent, or, or well, active, I should say, rather than prominent, more than one active legal advocacy group uh, uh, in the Asian community. And they're not always on the same side uh, within themselves, the Asian groups. And sometimes they're in different positions than are the NAACP and MALDEF. Uh, so, so part of what we're trying to do then is say, okay, nonetheless, given that we, you know, we tend to think of those three as the, the larger civil rights uh, of community of, of, uh, of interest groups and advocacy groups and so on, that we want to look at that. Secondly, what we did was to extend our data over, over time. Our data in, in the book was like from 1974 to 2003, and now we have it up to 2013. So we've extended it over time. So what I just want to give you a, different, a little feel for as, as you know, political science students or aspiring political scientists and so on is you know, kind of like how we're trying to work our way through this. It's, you know, it's a little bit like you know, they talk about politics is like you know, making sausage. And sometimes uh, research can have a little bit of that flavor more so than what we might like to think or hope. And we know of some examples where it's something else entirely. <laughs> but I, I won't go there. Uh, but in any case, so let me just tell you a little about, about what we have here. So OK, what does this graph uh, show you? This basically looks at, and again, you can't read it, so I'll have to read this for you. It says, the annual frequency count of racial ethnic interest group uh, signatures, that is, filing of briefs. And so what we have here are the data for the, the red uh, lines. There are the African-American groups. The greens are the uh, Hispanic or, or Latino groups. And the purple color is the Asian groups. And this is how many briefs they filed over time. Uh, so to starting here in 1974 all the way to 2013. This is just the sheer number uh, th that, that there are. And, and you know, as, as you probably can, can tell from this, the NAACP, the African American group in this case, has done the most. I mean, in many ways, they are kind of like the iconic group in this regard. And I think we already knew and understood this, but this just kind of you know, uh, uh, reinforces that point. But one of the things we see, though, is that there is quite a bit of difference here in terms of the level of activity of the, of the different groups and the level of activity from year to year as well. One of the things that we will have to look at, we haven't really started looking at yet, is what helps us explain some of these spikes, for example. There's some real spikes in, in certain years and you know what's going on in those years. 
uh, you know, there are several factors that might be going on, what the, what the Supreme Court's agenda is in the first place in that particular year and how that would affect the group's uh, level of interest and concern and, and involvement. But so, so there is, you know, that to begin with in terms of uh, the, what we're looking at. All right, so we had to collect all the data for this. But then the second thing we're trying to look at, and ultimately what we want to try and do, is explain some of the behaviors. But, but again, this is descriptive. Uh, the next thing uh, this one uh, tells us is that you look at the racial ethnic group's uh, signatures and what types of cases they're involved in, what types of cases brought to the court. Okay. Now, as you, as you, I don't know if you can see this, but you will not be surprised to see that civil rights is 55% of what these groups are involved in. All right. But then there are other things here like, and I don't know the specifics of all these, this is something else where I have to learn this. I mean, one of the difficulties sometimes when you study issues of race ethnicity is that I come at it uh, from that, that kind of perspective or analytical focus, but to do the, uh, some of the kind of work that I'm doing, which is not necessarily behavioral or mass attitudes and so on, when you're trying to look at other things, you have to become a little bit more knowledgeable or a lot more knowledgeable in Congress or the courts and so on. So in, in some respects, you're kind of, you know, you have to be careful that you're not saying the things that, that are not correct by the standards of, of the research agendas in these other fields. But in any case, uh, you see that, you know, there are these other cases. This is judicial power, the one that you probably cannot read right there. But these are, you know, criminal procedure, due process, economic activity, federalism, and so on. These are the uh, categories that have been used by scholars of the courts uh, to, uh, to examine these, these uh, kinds of uh, issues and uh, questions, all right? So that's just you know, another kind of descriptive step. Now the next one tries uh, to look at not only this broad pattern, but then tries to uh, uh, disaggregate it by the different groups. So here what we have is uh, the African American groups, Hispanic groups, and Asian groups. And again, to what extent are the, the cases on which they are filing briefs in the particular areas of, of the uh, of, of uh, 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 cases. So you find here, interestingly, the Asian groups are doing, uh, you know, the, overall they're less active than others, but, but uh, in, in important respects, they're really focusing on civil rights per se. You know? And all of them have a prominence of, of, of civil rights issues per se, but, but it's interesting that the Asian groups have that more than the others. Now, why is that? You know, one of the things we have to kind of ascertain or think about and then analyze is why is it uh, uh, that they would be act more active in those things than others? Well, you know, a kind of an obvious answer would be, oh, those are more important to them for some reason, but what is that reason? How, how, do, we, how do we begin, you know, understanding that and so on? But again, this, this is uh, meant to then, you know, just kind of further the analysis in terms of of uh, thinking about what the patterns are. Again, just descriptive data, but here's what we think is uh, those patterns are. But then this is another way, though, of trying to look at the activities uh, as well. So, so again, it's not only a matter of looking at you know, uh, how many filings there are and in what areas, but we're also interested in, in many ways, this is the crux of what we're trying to uh, begin to understand is what is the relationship between the groups? And this is where it's kind of, I think, an extension of our previous work and extension of some of the uh, previous other work. So, you know, this tells us, you know, so uh, on the, of the cases that we have here, 19, all three of them signed on to a case. But you see that African-American groups, uh, this is really the NAACP by and large, this is really MALDEF, but there are a couple of other groups that are file a case brief here and there, and at least for the moment, we're kind of collapsing them, but there may be other reasons why we want, might want to separate out those other groups, but at least for now, for certain purposes, we're doing it this way. So this gives us a feel then for, for what these patterns are uh, in terms of this. Now, one of the things that, that we are doing as well, let me just, let me just note this, and I think, I think this is hopefully a, a little bit of an additional contribution that we're making here. Some of the research that has looked at these kinds of, of issues have looked at whether or not the groups co-sign on the same brief. So do Paul and I both sign the same brief, okay? But another might say, again, there, here's, a, here's a case 
that's before the court, and she might find, she might uh, sign or draw up a separate brief, and I draw up a separate brief. So we, you know, we wanted to kind of look at that as well and say, what does that tell us? Again, as I mentioned a few moments ago, that it may be that there's different kinds of issues or, or, or specific legal arguments that we're looking for. This kind of collapses those, but, but this, this helps us uh, you know, think about this at least uh, for now, all right? So then the next step is, so given that we've got this kind of pattern, then the next question is why and when, what are the conditions, what are the explanations for why groups might do what they do when they do, all right? So the next step, and this is where we begin to get into the analysis, but we have not yet done the analysis, but I just want to give you a feel of how we're trying to move in that direction. Uh, uh, so, all right, here, here's what we have, okay. We can look at, at the, there's a whole bunch of iterations of what might happen, of how the groups might happen. Again, this may not be readable, particularly to those of you in the back, so let me just read for you a little bit. Our, you know, here, here's the iterations that are possible. So we, here's a, what we would call independence. We can imagine a case, an issue, a, a, a brief, where let's say a black group, NAACP, files on the case and no other of the racial ethnic groups file on it. Then we can look at Latino groups, and there may be a case where they file and others don't file on it, and uh, yet another one where we have Asian groups and no one else files on it, okay? Th th those would be different dimensions or iterations of independence, as we're calling it here, okay? But then we can talk about where the groups kind of are on the same side, but they don't necessarily co-sign. And we use the term concurrence. Why do we use the term concurrence? Well, partly because, you know, that's a term that's often used in legal decisions or writing of, of opinions and so on. So in a sense, we're trying to say, well, do the groups concur? So, you know, so we can look at it, uh, some cases where it may be that only a black and, and Latino group file, but they, they, they write different briefs, okay? Then we have only a black a group files and an Asian group files and so on. And concurrence would be all three of them file, but they all three file their separate, their separate uh, briefs, okay? Then here is what we call different forms of cooperation, more or less shallow or, or, or deeper. We're trying to come up with con conceptualization we hope will help clarify our thinking and thinking in general about this, is that uh, you know, it could be that black uh, situation where black uh, groups co-sign and Latino groups co-sign. So again, they're signing on the same one, and again, these these other iterations. And then here, uh, where uh, you know we can have two of the groups co-sign and the other one files separately, and so on. So there is all these iterations here. Okay. So, so what we will be doing in our analysis is to try and look at almost each of these possibilities. Each of those, I think, there's 13 possibilities there and see how often does each of those happen. We don't have the data on that. We got the data there, but we haven't sorted it out yet. But so that will be one of the first steps that we want to take is just say, what are the patterns there? And then, you know, after we have that descriptive say, you know, uh, uh, X number of times and X percentage of the cases are an example of a black independence and so on. So we can, again, begin to kind of delve into this and give this a greater uh, some, some, hopefully some greater understanding of, of what's going on there. But then more directly, we want to examine this in a very direct way. So what I'm going to put up next is also a bunch of words, but I'm just going to indicate to you kind of the explanations or the theories, if you will, that have been put forth to, you know, here's, here's what we're trying to identify and explain these patterns here. And then the next question is, well, what are the factors that we think would explain this? Okay, so let, let me tell you about at least how we're doing that in this particular project. Okay, uh, these are, you know, so these things that you see listed here are uh, you're trying to explain the group's decision to file an amicus brief. And in other research, which we're not doing right now, these, a lot of these same things are used to try and say, well, was this group or that group successful in, in, in terms of, of filing the brief and what the court decided on the case, all right? So what we're looking at then is, is several kinds of things. And some of this kinds of comes out of research that uh, Frank and, and people that Frank has worked with uh, uh, look at this stuff. All of the work that they have done has been more directly focused upon in uh, lobbying Congress. We're taking some of those ideas and trying to uh, apply them to, to the legal arena, the, the amicus brief arena. But here's what, here's what, we, you know, here's what we have. 
things like, well, why, why would a, a groups decide to file at all or file jointly or separately? One argument is the strength of the opposition. So there's a case before the court, and what is the group's assessment of how strong that opposition is? And if you think the opposition is stronger, we assume that they would be more likely to sign on, uh, file something because you feel like you want to marshal your forces as much as possible. Another, though, would be the previous experience in a coalition because these kinds of activities are presumably ongoing over time. And part of it is you want to see, well, what other groups have been involved and when it comes to these cases or these issues, is it the, is it the case that you know, we, we look at this other group as a, a, a likely potential ally and so on, all right? Uh, uh, and also, uh, you know, the, the literature also indicates, well, whether a particular group is, is pivotal or critical to the success of the coalition. In the work that we're doing at this point, at least, we're, th we're thinking, well, that would be the NAACP. So they would be kind of like the pivotal group that we will look at in terms of, you know, that they will be the most likely. And if they do, if they, uh, 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 so, you know, or get involved, then the others are more likely. But that's something we'll have to ascertain, but that would be kind of an expectation that we would have going in. But then, this is the one that, at least for what we're working on, we think would be the most critical, uh, is the nature of the policy issue. What is the issue itself? So there could be some issues that some groups are gonna be motivated to get involved in, but others are not. Let me just give one quick example. The data that we have at this point, which we've only looked at in a very rudimentary kind of way, says suggest the following and after i say it, it may not be entirely surprising but issues or cases dealing with immigration you tend to find that the naacp is less likely to file in those cases and the latino and asian groups are more likely to file at least that's what seems to be the the initial kind of fine and again that makes some intuitive sense uh, but again uh, in in many ways we're trying to say okay to what extent does, you know, there's the old argument that you probably heard or old phrase you probably heard that uh, a lot of times we think policy determines politics as much as politics determines policy. All right, and in a sense, this is saying that it could well be the issue that in and of itself has a, 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 a significant impact on which groups decide to get involved and, and the like. Another is the characteristics of the groups. I mean, one of the, I mean, the groups we're looking at are all focused on the legal arena. Uh, their ad legal advocacy groups focus on the legal arena, but we can look at other attributes of them in terms of their resources, whether or not they have their levels of funding and, and er uh, various other indicators that we're probably going to look at. Uh, another one that we're looking at that we're not sure exactly how to, to take this into account is the institutional environment in which policy, uh, policy takes place. Well, I mean, we are, we are aware that we are doing this, but we're looking at a particular institutional environment. We're looking at the legal processes, whereas you know, something like the, the, the legislative process, Congress, would be different. So that's something we are kind of incorporating all of, you know, of, it just, uh, it, it just our, our analysis re requires that we assume that and, and, and uh, that's part of what we want to do anyway. Again, it's focused on that environment. Then another is the network or other collaborative environment of the coalition and its uh, allies. Well, this, that, the reason I have that one in red, let me indicate to you, is that in our study, that's really our dependent variable. That's really our dependent variable, because if you look at that and look at that, you can see how that is really the, the, the way of thinking about those different iterations there. Okay? All right. So, uh, so we, look at, we, we will be uh, looking at that as well. Then we're also looking at the, uh, the research, the previous research says we need to look at the, quote, the political environment. And, and that's uh, kind of, in some ways, a little bit of a, a broad, nebulous kind of notion. But some people argue, well, what's the ideological uh, patterns of the time? Is there a more liberal or conservative mood in the country? And there's been research along those lines. So we're going to try and address that. But the way we're trying to address it is that there are actually some scholars who have done these ideology scores for the Supreme Court. So they have like an ideology score of the Supreme Court for each, each, uh, each uh, session of the court, uh, each term of the court, I should say. Uh, so, so we're going to look at that. So, you know, we don't know what we're going to find yet. Uh, we don't know what we're going to find. I mean, we have kind of theories, expectations, uh, and, and the like. And, and we also have to think through a lot in terms of how exactly we're going to do the analysis. Uh, there are various ways that we might do it in terms of 
thinking about uh, constructing or measuring the dependent variable and some of these others, and then some of the data that we thought was out there in a fairly read readily available fashion is not, so we're having to do some more work in that regard. But in any case, what we're trying to do then is, is again, to look at issues of race and inter-minority groups uh, uh, in particular. Again, looking at them as an extension of our previous work, looking at them in the legal arena, but with more groups over a longer period of time, with a different set of questions. We're not, we're not only asking if they file, do they file or not, or, and are they on the same side? We're ultimately trying to get at why do they file? which is, we think, a more fundamental question in, 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 a, in a significant way. And if this research pans out in any kind of interesting, constructive way, which we certainly hope it will, given the time and effort we've invested thus far, uh, is, is that we, you know, we think of, of a couple of other things we would want to do in terms of analyzing this. Again, assuming that this leads us to think it's worth our time and, and effort. And that is, a, let me just indicate that to you. Uh, one of the things uh, uh, that we thought that we're going to do is that if it is the case where where you know going back to this, let's say we have let's look at look at this. Oh, let me look down. Uh, let's say we go here. Cooperation. Uh, let's say blacks and Latinos co-sign on one, and the Asians f uh, groups file a separate one. It's not only you know that they file a separate one, but I mentioned that we want to understand the legal grounding, the legal rationale that they're giving. Well, we're going to try and look at that and code the analysis. Say, you know, what are they using different terms or, or groundings? Are they talking more about diversity versus uh, historic discrimination, uh, or you know, what, what is the nature of the of the of the rationale that is given? So that's one thing that we want to do is to then uh, you know look at it in. I think in a more in-depth and I think in some ways more interesting kind of way looking at the, uh, what, what the nature of those arguments are. But in addition to that then what we want to look at later is that uh, once we can identify which are the areas where, where these groups, those uh, racial ethnic minority advocacy groups are involved, then look at kind of a set of broader uh, what you might call contemporary liberal coalitions in American politics. So. We want to look at uh, if, if, if the racial ethnic groups are involved, is it the case that women's groups are also involved in a case? Is it the case that labor unions are also involved in a case? And you know, so, so we're trying to then, so we would take this as kind of a, a starting point or a foundation, if you will, and then try and expand that to other, to other areas or you know, uh, another set of policy issues. Uh, uh, so, so the way we're going to look at this analysis, we're going to look at the, these groups and their involvement on civil rights cases versus non-civil rights cases. And then we're going to look at their involvement on different kinds of civil rights cases. So different kinds of civil rights cases, like is it housing discrimination or education discrimination or whatever. So, so we're, we're going to look at this study in, in, uh, in, in those kinds of ways. And then if and as we look at the other study going beyond just the racial ethnic uh, legal advocacy groups, we're, we would then presumably try and extend that there as well. Okay. So I just wanted to share with you a little bit, you know, some of this research that I'm working on, uh, and and you know, just to you know, just conclude by saying that, you know, these are the kinds of things that you know. I don't know if you find this interesting, but certainly my colleagues and I who've worked on this certainly think this is really interesting and important as as American society is becoming more diverse in various kinds of ways, and uh, uh, looking at how the various groups that are seem to be the, the racial ethnic minority groups in the society, what their place is, how they relate to each other, and how they relate to each other in terms of their efforts to influence government and policy, and how it, it varies or might vary across different institutions over time with regard to different issues, those kinds of things. So those are all the kinds of things that I think are, again, the, at least they, I think they reflect, uh, speaking for myself, they, re they reflect what, what kind of motivates me and animates me in terms of the questions that I'm interested in, and also taking very seriously the efforts to try and address these and examine these as systematically as possible. 
So what I'm, I'll conclude by saying I hope you will join people like me in these kinds of endeavors in the future. And I, I, I'm, I'm very confident that the foundation that you've gotten here at RBSI uh, and that attracted you to RBSI, but that you've, that, that you've built since you've been here at RBSI will you know, spur you to think about these, these issues further and spur you to go to graduate school to be able to study these kinds of issues and questions. So thank you all very much. Thank you.